So for the select founders who are able to establish product market fit and raise their Series A or bootstrap their way there, fewer survive to a stage where they're ready to raise a Series B. And unfortunately, by that token, that means there's less information available on the process and the ins and outs of raising a Series B round. So today we're joined by two prominent members of the venture capital community who will help shed some light on this topic and, and hopefully demystify some questions around the process, um, what metrics are, are utilized and assessed uh, for evaluation and more. So to help facilitate this discussion, uh, I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, Laura Bueller. Uh, Laura is our leader here at C100, and I'm sure many of you have, in the audience have had the pleasure of being connected with her at some point in time. Laura spent nearly five years here working tirelessly in her goal to help support, inspire, and connect except, exceptional Canadians in tech from around the world. Prior to joining C100, Laura had helped, held multiple strategy and business development titles during her five years at Gilt concluding her tenure there as Senior Director of Business Development. And before Gilt, Laura had worked for McKinsey as a consultant, managing projects for various multinational clients across North America and Europe. And without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our two speakers to the stage, Dion Chinko and Elliot Robinson. Dion is a principal at Insight Partners and works with portfolio companies to accelerate growth and also drives market diligence for potential investments. She's currently a board member for JAMA Software and Checkmarks, and prior to joining Insight, Dion also worked at Google. Her focus at the time there was on global business operations and strategy, where she led cross-functional projects across merchandising, promotions, product, and partnerships. And before that, she was a consultant at Boston Consulting Group uh, and Director of Business Intelligence and Strategy at Oyster Books which is a content digital, a digital content startup that was acquired by Google. At BCG, she focused on growth strategy and new market entry for, for tech, healthcare, retail, and financial services clients. And at Oyster, Dion worked closely with the founders to drive company strategy, investor relations, and operational decisions around product, marketing, and content. Elliot is a partner at Bessemer in the San Francisco office, where he focuses primarily on growth investments in SaaS and cloud, com cloud companies. He also co-authors Bessemer's iconic 10 Laws of Cloud Computing and the annual State of the Cloud Report. Elliot is also currently a board member for Hyperspace, Imply Data, and Hinge Health. Prior to joining uh, Bessemer, Elliot was a partner with M12, leading investments in companies such as Livongo, Bluevine, Trusona, and Cooler Screens. Elliot started his career with Syncom Venture Partners, investing in both early and growth stage enterprise software and frontier tech companies such as Clear and Iridium Communications. After six years with Syncom, he joined Georgian Partners, investing in a number of successful growth, growth stage software companies such as Turnitin, which was acquired by Advance, Kinsir, which was acquired by Medware, and eCentire. It's a pleasure to have both of you here today, and I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us on this important topic. With that, I'm going to pass it off to you, Laura, and we can get this discussion underway. Thanks so much, Cameron. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot and Dion, for being here with us today. Um, Elliot, you are a, not a Canadian, but you are a former Torontonian. Um, and so we like to think of you as like an adoptive Canadian. Um, <laughs> before we, of course, Cam has covered your illustrious professional background. Um, before we get into things, I thought you could just share a little bit of where you've touched our community in a number of different ways, um, both through Canada, living in Canada, and through some of your recent um, investing activity. I thought you could just share a few words about that before we get going. Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, it's good to see some familiar faces on the Zoom, which is great. And I try my absolute best to, to maintain my honorary Canadian status. Um, so working with entrepreneurs uh, from Canada, East Coast, West Coast, in between is always something I, I love to do. Um, I often remark, and, and my wife knows this, Toronto is the best city I've ever lived in. And I've had the opportunity to live in some really cool places, both in North America and beyond. Um, my wife as well. Uh, Look, I, I start most of my weeks on a text thread or a WhatsApp thread 
with my ex-colleagues from Georgian Partners, who mm. I still talk to all the time. Um, for any of you that know them, uh, one of the partners, Tyson Baber, is uh, one of my best friends and a groomsman in my wedding two years ago. So I'm, I'm very familiar with them. Um, they just had an IPO of a company with Bessemer called CS Disco yesterday, and an exit in a company called Chorus AI here in um, San Francisco, but has Canadian roots as well through, through the founder. So I talk to them all the time. Um, Toronto's probably, I would say Toronto to Waterloo is the tech scene I spend the most time in outside of the Bay Area. Um, and I, I'm just really lucky to, to still have that connection, mostly through Georgian partners, but through many of the other early stage venture funds and uh, entrepreneurs I've had a chance to work with. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, you are uh, really the perfect guy to be having this conversation with us. Um, and I'm going to just kick it over to Dion, who I just had the pleasure of meeting for the first time last week. Dion, you are based, oh, it's, I guess I should say, Elliot, you're based in the Bay Area, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. We're awesome. You're in the Bay Area. So am I. Um, Dion, over to you. Uh, you are in New York. Is that true today? <laughs> That is true today. Um, although, you know, I think borders are opening up, uh, thankfully, finally, between the US and Canada borders. And it's it's so grateful for that. And I'll, you know, being able to kind of reconnect with family across the board. But yeah, even though I'm based here in New York today, you know, obviously, talk to, to all my friends on that side a ton. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned George and Elliot, we kind of collaborate with them quite a bit. Um, but certainly lot lots of chatter, you know, back and forth and back and forth both ways. Awesome. And um, Dion, you're originally from Vancouver, right? I am. I'm originally from Vancouver, uh, you know, lived there for 10 years, but also lived uh, in Toronto for three. So I will say both of them are amazing, amazing cities. I love them both uh, for very different reasons um, and I would happily go back to either. Awesome. Before we move on, I just to Dion's point, I, I feel like it's important to say, as many of you may know, the founders of Georgian were venture backed uh, Canadian entrepreneurs from a company called DWL. Uh, Insight Partners was the largest investor in that company, sold their company to IBM. So of the seven investments I made at Georgian, uh, four of them were with uh, Dion's partners. So, and her founding partners at the firm were the first LPs in Georgian. Uh, that's a fun fact yeah. most people don't know. So there's everything I learned, quite frankly, uh, from growth equity comes from Insight. And I believe our first LP pitch deck said we're the inside of Canada. So we, <laughs> we shamelessly put that out there. Um, so that's, there's a lot of connective tissue on the call today. Wow. Ex I did not know that. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person who didn't know that. Um, and I am a student of the Canadian tech ecosystem. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so just to set the context, um, this call, we've got mostly founders on the line. Um, at least half of them are fellows in C100's fellowship program, um, which is our, um, our mentorship program targeted at early stage um, founders, of, uh, Canadian founders of early stage technology companies. And several of them are starting to approach growth rounds. And this is, um, as Cameron, you mentioned at the very beginning, um, you know, we started to overhear, overhear um, some note swapping amongst the cohort and people kind of wanting to share notes on like, what's the market doing right now? Everyone's been heads down building um, their companies. And so we wanted to use this opportunity to actually ask people from the other side of the table. Um, and the impetus for doing this is actually one of our fellows who I think is on the line right now, Adrian um, Kamara, who uh, really loved hearing actually uh, uh, FJ Yang, uh, who, uh, is the CEO, Canadian CEO of Imply, Elliot, that you just led the um, most recent Series C in and joined um, FJ's board, which is awesome. And we thought, okay, well, it'd be great then to hear from the other side of the table too. Um, and so we have a lot of founders in the call, um, some um, approaching Series B quickly, others uh, have just raised an A, and then others are just um, approaching A and want to be um, get smart uh, before they before they head into that next phase. And so we thought we could just kick it off by asking both of you to comment on really what is a series B? Um, and I don't mean the obvious, like of course it comes after A and before C, but how is it actually different? How does it separate from earlier, earlier rounds from in institutional rounds, for example? I'll ask both of you to answer that or if, you, if either of you has like a, an answer you wanna jump in with. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I will say, I'll answer it first with some context, which is, um, the letters don't mean what they used to mean. 
when I started my career 15 years ago. And I think particularly the market we're living in now, I mean, who knows? I, I would say, um, I would redefine it, the question slightly to say, what is an expansion capital round look like? Um, and let's just use Series B as, as the placeholder or Series C. Um, I think for me, I, I've had the same framework uh, around investing. It's, it's kind of five pillars. But when I think about a Series B, it's really about um, predictability of the business model uh, and customer love. Those are like the two things that really matter to me. I know we're going to kind of talk about metrics before, but you know, we all know this on the call, different from perhaps your, your seed or series A where it's kind of V1, maybe V1.1 or 1.2 of the product. The series B, you typically have a cohort of customers that have been using your product for at least a year. Um, you've kind of got some learnings from them. And if I boil it down to, as a growth stage investor, being beyond the metrics that matter to me the most, and again, it's gonna be a little bit different for every investor. I care most when, when we talked about um, kind of cohort performance and then customer love. On the cohort performance side, what I really, really care about is the ratio between gross net dollar retention and then um, you know any kind of uplift or net dollar retention that you're gonna see. So I think it's actually tied because you know, leveraging like a FJ Yang, I'm, I'm not gonna like talk about private company stuff, but I will say that his net dollar retention um, was well above kind of 120%. So what does that mean? Um, if you take out any kind of pricing changes, it just means the customers that paid last year or within whatever the renewal period was are deciding to spend more or increase seats or it's expanding throughout the customer set. So I, that's kind of been the source of truth for me. Um, and then I'll take a step back and, and talk about just scaling of efficiency. So the other kind of true north metric for me has always been gross margin payback period. So that's just, you know, gross margin effective. How many months does it take for you to take kind of net new logo or customer one and turn it positive? And that's based on your turn and some other things we can kind of go into the nitty gritty. But those for me are the three metrics that really matter. Um, now, of course, that has that's like secondary to who you are as a founder and a team and the problem you're solving and all of that. But I, I, I start with those metrics to say different from your seed or series A, you know, there's typically, I've been doing this a long time, there's typically a direct correlation between when a company starts to expose you to some of their performance metrics to how proud they are about their metrics. And I'll say that to say um, when FJ went out to raise his, uh, his growth round, literally all the metrics that matter to me were on slide two. So he told me what the company was and then literally it was like, this is how we got here. This is how much we burned, net dollar retention, gross dollar retention. It was all there. And it doesn't have to be a perfect story. No company is perfect. It's just how can you contextualize each one of those metrics to tell your story about what the next kind of 18 months look like. Dion, uh, do you have anything to add about how you look at this round differently than earlier rounds? Yeah, same here. I, I agree with Elliot in that, you know, I would get less attached to the labels A, B, and C and less attached to the numbers attached to them um, and focus more on what it means to stage of growth. I think of series B as, you know, basically when a business has proved something and has achieved some level of product market fit, it's proven that something is working and is basically ready to, to, to show that there's a repeatable sales motion there and that they're ready to scale to go to market to basically accelerate that. Um, you know, what that looks like means a lot of things to different people. Um, I think that, you know, kind of to the metrics point, there are clear high level core metrics that demonstrate that, you know, and the main one being net new ARR and the fact that that is accelerating uh, year over year, um, you know, and, and obviously your gross and net retention are, are key in that. But then there are other indicators too that are really dependent on, you know, the type of business model that you have. I think now that you're seeing kind of tech, you know, really diversify the number of industries that, that, that are being penetrated, um, you know, core metrics might differ for every single business model. So for like an e-commerce marketplace, we'll be looking at your GMB and how that's scaling. For like a PLG led product, we'll be looking at free to at your free to pay conversion, for example. For an enterprise solution that's focused on a couple of big customers, we might be focused on those, you know, two big customers and what they have to say about you. Um, so you know what it looks like can be very, very different based on what you're trying to build. Um, mm -hmm. But again, the point is that you've proven something and you're ready to kind of you know scale that up now.
So you've proven something, Dion. Um, and so you're not, uh, you've already de-risked uh, a certain part of the business. Um, what parts need to be de-risked and which parts are okay um, to still be uh, bets? I think I come back to, again, the product market fit. And, you know, you've proven that you're creating something of value and that you can articulate that and that your customer can articulate that as well. Um, and once you've proven that, I think that, you know, ideally the point of the series B is that you're asking for capital because you know what to do with it next. You know, you, you can take this and say, okay, now that I have this, this product market fit, I can actually take that and, and for example, scale my sales team or, or you know, expand to the next um, city or country, whatever it is. Um, so I think that, you know, it's okay not to have, you know, a massive 20 person sales team already hitting the ground uh, for you at that stage. Um, but it's not okay to not be able to prove um, or explain that, you know, this is actually what we're selling. This is our pitch. This is, you know, these are the customers that are fans of us and this is who we're going to go after next. Elliot, how, um, how do people know it's time to raise a growth round? Ooh, in today's market, there's no, no companies raising and every company is raising, right? I mean, there's luckily a bit of an abundance. I mean, the timing for this conversation is, is perfect because I'm assuming most of the folks on the call saw the kind of tech crunch article and the CB Insights article that talks about Canadian fundraising through the first half of this year versus last year. I think that's indicative of the entire kind of tech startup and venture capital ecosystem. Um, but I, look, I always, this is going to sound like a boring kind of academic answer, but we spent a lot of time in the, in the, you know, cloud computing laws talking about the sales and marketing learning curve. And there's this time where I feel like in the seed and series A, it's kind of like founder led sales, right? You're, you, you guys and gals are probably on every call. <laughs> you probably know every customer, not just by logo, but who the champion is and who's using it by name. Um, typically in the series B, you've brought on some type of sales leader, forget the name, like whether it's head of sales, VP sales, SVP, who, who cares? Um, and you're finally getting to the point where you've seen a rep or two kind of meet quota, your SDR functions working, your CS and upsell function is working. And now you're kind of pulled out of go to market except for maybe named accounts, or you feel like you're ready to pull yourself out and fire yourself. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call has eight different titles and jobs, but typically this is the one job you can fire, begin to fire yourself from day to day. Um, and you'll know you're ready to raise your series B when you can double down on, you know, as Dion said, kind of that product market fit along with a go to market motion that is somewhat mature. Um, of course, you're going to have to try new product SKUs or new strategies for product led growth or new geos. But typically, you've got some type of go-to-market engine that's working, and now you're you need to really test: is this scalable? And and I personally think that's the right time um, to raise your Series B. Uh, but I'm sure everyone on this call gets emails from folks like Dion and myself uh, <laughs> on a monthly basis, or sometimes I'm sure some of you probably daily basis. So it's it's just that that conversation with yourself on scale and go-to-market for me. Dion, um, maybe you could uh, answer this one. This is something that I've had a few founders ask me recently, and I actually don't really know the answer to it. What is a data room and what needs to be in it? Yeah, a, a data room is basically a compendium that houses all of the kind of obvious and important things that an investor is gonna ask you when they're, when they're basically going through their due diligence process. Um, so, you know, I, I can walk through the core documents that generally sit into that. The most important ones that we look for are, you know, first and foremost, your customer file. This is gonna show basically the rev ramp of every single customer that you've acquired to date. Um, and we're gonna use this to basically calculate your, your ARR ramp, your gross net logo retention, and basically the quality of your customer base. Um, so that's, you know, number one, hugely, hugely important. And to kind of what Elliot shared earlier, these are the headline metrics that we're gonna look at. Um, you know, a, a second thing, and again, this kind of depends on the maturity of uh, your go-to-market team, but, you know, sales pipeline, quotas, attainment, um, you know, we'll use this to calculate your kind of sales, overall sales and marketing efficiency, but also use it to kind of deep dive into, again, it, is it working, right? Is your, you know, the fact that you've kind of hired a couple of sales folks now, are they able to sell your product? Are they being successful in their roles? Um, 
in order to kind of believe that, you know, given a Series B investment, you're able to hire more and actually scale that team. Um, I think we'll be looking for like a basically a model and a five year plan. Um, and this is be, being basically a, a way to to get your articulation of how you see your company growing, what are the underlying assumptions that go into that, and then to have a conversation about whether those are believable or realistic or you know what what we should really pressure test. Um, and then there's you know we'll obviously kind of look at KPIs as I mentioned earlier. These will really differ by company um, and and business model, but you know again like GMB if it's a marketplace, if it's a consumer product look very much at LTV to CAC. Um, if it's a tech enabled service, it could be gross margin, but different, different key metrics kind of spike for different business models. And then there's like the long tail stuff, like your cap tail and product roadmap. Um, but again, I think that the important thing is that this data room should be something that is ready and prepped and bulletproof way before you begin the, the fundraise process. The last thing you want to do as an investor is get caught flat, flat, flat footed with all of these requests that are kind of half baked and you're kind of scrambling to pull it all together in the middle of the conversation with the investor. Um, it's pretty predictable what the list is. And so it's just have it ready ahead of time. And is it, I guess I'll ask this of both of you, is this actually required? And the reason I ask this is because of course you're hearing about preempting investments, um, you know, skyrocketing valuations, super competitive rounds, like how much, um, how much is actually required here to give away? Um, and I, I realize you guys are investors, so you're like, you're going to want all of it, but get, you know, give, give our founders an idea of um, what's kind of table stakes um, and what are some of the dynamics you're seeing in the market in terms of how these uh, conversations progress. Yeah, I, it's it's funny when I saw the question on uh, what is a data room, um, because I my honest answer in today's market is kind of a thing of the past. <laughs> like, it's very rare. Um, I think in this year alone, uh, I think there's been one investment I've looked at that had a, like a full predefined data room. It was actually a bit of a surprise. Now that doesn't mean that like through the conversation and through the diligence process, you don't like unearth many of the documents that Dion talked about. But, um, you know, typically it's just not something that, that I find unless it's like a super late stage company that's raising like a 300 or $400 million I kind of pre-IPO round or super large growth round. I think your average Series B company raising 20 to 50 or let's call it 15 to 40, whatever you pick. I think it's less of a data room as much as like the data path that Dion talked yeah. about. Like, here's the deck and articulation of the story. Here's some kind of Excel model that tells you how we think the company scales and the underlying drivers. And then some kind of customer master file, typically scrubbed without names that shows you by month or quarter how cohorts have, have kind of grown. For me, that's, that's typically like all I, I see. And sometimes I'm lucky to get to the customer file before you have to give an indication of interest or whether you'd like to invest. And then after that, a lot of the time, you know, you, you can unearth some of those other kind of deeper data paths. But um, to get to like an in or out decision, many times you're just working off of a deck and kind of a high level, you know, two to five year projection based on what you got. Yeah, I see a comment here in the chat from Thomas um, who says essentially have the data room built with all the data, but don't share the data room. It's it's just to get ready to share individual documents with investments when with investors when asked for, right? I mean, I look, my view is as a as a board member, I think it's just prudent to like keep these documents in some type of room shared file for two reasons. One, all your kind of VP level managers and up should kind of know these metrics and live these metrics and um, kind of make decisions in their individual divisions or orgs based on the health that, or either goals of those metrics. Um, and then because again, we're living in this world where a lot of companies don't like pause to raise like five years ago, you might say, okay, from, you know, August 1st to, October 1st, we're going to stop and talk to investors and raise and go through all of this. That's not necessarily the case. And what I found is if you're constantly updating these documents and thinking about this is like a data pack that you might share one day, um, you know, you'll be ready when, when two or three investors that you might like 
or you've been talking to and you say, you know what, we've got two quarters of really solid momentum in these core documents and data. And I'm now going to share that path with three or five of the investors that I really like who I've been keeping up with over the last six, six or 12 months. I think that's kind of how fundraising goes nowadays. You, you all would know better than I do from kind of the founder CEO side. But from the boards I work with and, and most of the companies I engage with at the series and beyond, that's kind of the dynamic. So again, just keeping that data pack kind of up to date, clean, not only will it help you internally as you scale, but um, it'll help you turn that green light on really quickly uh, when it comes to scaling as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll go over to Dion um, for this one, which is really around, um, so let's say, let's see now we're negotiating terms. Um, what's on the table as a series at the series B level in terms of um, what, like what's negotiable? So board seats, liquidation preferences, um, what are all the things you would expect to be um, negotiating at this, at this stage, Dion? I mirror what Elliot said, where <laughs> in this environment, things are a little bit nuts. Um, tell, tell us about that. Like what, you know, before and after today and five years ago, like what, what have you actually observed? I mean, I, I think investing is just always supply demand, right? And, um, you know, I think, you know, now if you have a very, very, very strong company and you have plenty of investors at the table, um, you have room to negotiate that said, you know, from an investor standpoint, like we will always want liquidation preference um, of 1x. Um, yeah, I think the board seat thing is is very dependent on the strategy as a firm um, and, and, and you know, how much ownership um, you're really going for um, and how much operational support you're really looking to provide. Um, but it can, sometimes we, we ask for it, sometimes we don't, like it really, really depends per situation. Um, I think something that is important um, in this environment is I think every investor will want some sort of parata because I think it's in, in this environment, like the main way to win is you, you want, really do want to keep doubling down on your winners and the ability to do that is very important. Um, so I think that's probably what I'd focus on, but I don't know, Elliot, it's <laughs> what do you think change every day. <laughs> No, I, I think that's spot on. I don't, I don't really have much to add on that perspective. Hmm. Um, there's a, uh, a question about uh, traditional venture firms competing with the kind of Tiger, Global, Co2, Altimeter, et cetera, um, for, uh, and the question specifically is, are there any more traditional venture firms that are actually able to compete with these guys right now? I think it depends on what you define as compete. So every, every entrepreneur has to kind of chart their own path and scale their company and partner with capital providers in the way that's best for them. I, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge that there's a new class of growth and early stage investor that's offering a different product. I, typically that kind of leads to innovation in our industry in the same way that it does kind of in the startup tech verticals and sectors you all work in. Um, so I'll go back to my opening statement, which is what, what does it mean to compete? So, you know, my style and my partner's style is to be, or try our best to be, uh, the first phone call that any founder or C-level executive CEO primarily makes when they need real advice from a totally aligned, interested party. In our case, you know, an investor and shareholder in the company. Um, you know, a, a Tiger Global, for instance, they're very different in that way. They have invested in led Series B rounds and CEOs that we've backed. And the beauty of that is that means for a whole nother round or 12 or 18 months, we're definitely the first call that they're going to make. Because after Tiger Invest, you're not going to hear from them again until it's time to kind of pre-IPO or raise like a big kind of IPO-ish kind of round. Um, so it depends on what you want from your capital partner. And again, I don't begrudge them because there's a lot of founders that they necessarily don't want that, or they like the fact that their board is two investors, um, maybe a seed investor, a series A or series B, and taking on some capital from a tiger or altimeter or whatever that wants to be a little more passive. Maybe it allows them to think through their board composition differently and say, okay, well, I've got two or three active investors now, and this capital allows me to, you know, grow my board by two seats, um, make it 
more independent focused earlier on and find some subject matter experts that kind of help me shape my board differently. I, I don't think that's a problem. That might work for some founders. Um, for me, as, as a growth stage investor that's been doing this a long time, I think the real value that, that you uh, gather working with someone like myself or Dion or kind of anyone in the space that approaches it this way is we have the benefit of seeing this so many other times. And many of the challenges that a Series B or Series C company is going to go through, we've seen it. Uh, we can bring you into that community of, of founders and go to market professionals and finance people who've done that before, um, and then hopefully be a thought partner for you as you're thinking about scaling your team, your go-to-market, your product, marketing, and everything uh, else. So I, I again, I'll, I'll end the point by saying I'm not like... Uh, I'm not bothered by new entrants in the space. I just think it benefits founders ultimately. And it's up to you to decide what do you want out of your growth investor. Yeah, I I could resonate with this more. I think I think something that's been lost in the conversation of like valuations and multiples and all these new entrants coming in is that building a business is really, really hard, as you all well know. Um, and it's really helpful to have somebody to call. Um, through all, all of it and, and you know someone who's who's seen it before and if, if, if not directly someone who can connect you to someone else who can help um, and it's very helpful to have kind of that network there again I think appreciating to the choir here probably with C100 and Lauren and all of you guys being connected but um, it can go a long way um, because you know a funding round is just yet another step in the long process you know between each round like you do have company building to do um, and that stuff's hard.